This video is going to look at the absolute value function, its parent function, and then seven key features. Now just to jump off, uh, an absolute value parent function is going to be y equals the absolute value of x. So this right here is my most basic parent function. If I wanted to add some stuff to it, I could have y equals m and then the absolute value of x plus b where m is going to be my slope and b my y-intercept. In this video, we'll have seven features, the overall shape of the graph, the x and y-intercepts, symmetry, vertex, and behavior, domain and range, and rates of change over intervals. If you need to jump to a specific topic, go ahead and look in the description, and I'll have a timestamp to jump there. Let's look at the overall shape of this graph here. So here we can see that it's going up forever to the left and the right here. And actually, this looks like a V. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. Looks like a V, which is convenient because it is an absolute value. And there's our V. So the absolute value function is always going to look like a V. Also, it is made up of two separate rays or edges. Here's one going up here, and here's another one going here. So I know that it's made from two rays or edges. Now these rays or edges, there's something about this one. This one has a positive slope, and this one has a negative slope. So I know that one ray, one side, is positive, and one side is negative. Now this isn't the only absolute value function we could have. We could have one that is upside down like this. So it would be coming down here one side, coming down here another side. Does this still pass everything? Yes, it looks like a V. Yes, it's made from two rays. One side is the positive ray, one side is the negative ray. What if I took this same one and slid it over and I had something like this? I was coming down here and then I went off here. Okay. Does this still follow the rules? Looks like a V made from two rays. So these are the key features of the shape of an absolute value function. Looking at the X and Y intercepts of the absolute value function, remember that the X intercept is going to lie along the X axis right here, and the y-intercept is going to lie along the y-axis right here. So where my blue line touches these is right there. So that actually means that my x-intercept is going to be 0, 0 for my x and y, and my y-intercept is going to be 0, 0. Pretty boring, pretty straightforward. So I have two more examples down here that I'm hoping are going to be a little bit more exciting. What if I have an absolute value function that's in fact down here and it's upside down? So my x-intercept is going to be where this graph touches my x. So where does it actually touch my x? Absolutely nowhere. So my x-intercept does not exist. That's way more exciting. How about my y-intercept? My y-intercept is where I touch my y-axis. Whoops. There we go. And you can see that happens right here at negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7. So I'm going to have 0 and negative 7. What if I just want to slide over my original function and maybe put it down here? 
So I have one coming up here and coming like this. Actually, let's reset those. I have one coming here and one coming here. Okay. Again, my X intercept is going to be where I touch my X axis. Wait a minute. This is another fun one. I touch twice. I touch at negative one, two, three. So I have negative three comma zero. And I have one at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So at negative eight comma zero. Now let's look at the y-intercept. I wonder if I have two for the y-intercept as well. So we check my y-axis and it only touches one time at positive one, two, and three. And there we have our x and y-intercepts. You can see how we'd find them on some absolute values. All right, for symmetry, remember we're going to be thinking about a face and what does it mean to have a symmetric face. So here I have a cat with a face and symmetry means that if I cut this right down the middle, it should look pretty much the same on both sides. And this cat seems pretty symmetric. Now what would happen if I came in here and this side, instead of having cat ear, we're going to put in a mouse style ear. So here, let's give them big mouse ear. Ooh, where we go. All right, looks kind of funny. Is this symmetric? This would not be symmetric because now we have a big difference between the two sides. So if we look at my graph over here, let's ask ourselves the same question. If I cut it down the middle, does it in fact mirror itself? And yes, it does. This is going up here. This is going up here. If I travel maybe one, two, three over, I'm up three. If I travel one, two, three over, I'm up three. So this is perfectly symmetric. It is symmetric. over the vertex. And we're going to learn that this right here is the vertex. Ooh, this looks like an angry face. We have a little angry eyebrows here. Got a little mustache. And then let's do an angry mouth. Hey, hey, I'm symmetric. That's what that guy's saying. In the last section, we actually talked about uh, vertex very quickly. Um, but the definition of a vertex would be the point connecting two or more edges. So here, it's pretty clear that we have one nice distinct edge right here and another nice distinct edge right here. What makes them distinct is they have different slopes, different properties. And then the point that's connecting them is just going to be this spot right there. So here, for an absolute value function, my vertex would equal zero comma zero. Now, if we go back to one of the examples I used before, which was uh, an absolute value function going like this, then my vertex would be right here. So that would be at one, two, three, four. So my vertex for this one would be at four and then negative one, two, three, four, and negative four. And behavior is asking the question, if I go forever, what's going to happen? So let's try and go forever here. Let's go to the end, and what isn't on my graph is an implied arrow. And up here, I have another implied arrow. So if I think about traveling this way forever, I'm always going up and I'm always going to the right. Same here. I'm always going up and I'm always going to the left. So there's going to be a component that goes forever left and right and forever up. 
So my end behavior says goes forever left and right and it goes forever up. Now this would be different if I have this different graph here, different absolute value. Now this one would be going forever down, forever left, forever down, forever right. So it would be a little bit different, but you can see the general picture. We're going to be going up or down forever, and we're going to be going left and right forever. Domain and range is looking at the question of how far does my graph go left and right, and how far my graph goes up and down. So domain is the movement that is left to right here. Whoops, wrong color. Domain is left to right, and range is up and down. So my domain, I'm going to the right forever. So the number that is forever is positive infinity, and here the number would be negative infinity. Okay, so my domain would be defined as negative infinity is less than x is less than positive infinity. Ooh, infinity is hard to make. Now, range for an absolute value function is a little bit more exciting. Here I'm going up forever, so that's going to be positive infinity. Here I'm going up forever, so that's also positive infinity. So I know positive infinity is my top value. What if I'm traveling down the line here? What if I'm going down and down? Do I ever go farther than this? The answer is no. So my lowest value is going to be zero. So my range is going to be defined as zero is less than or equal to because right here at the vertex, it does in fact touch zero. And then, ooh, no, not x, we should have y is less than infinity. And this is the top part. Let's look at the rate of change over different intervals. Now remember that rate is just a code word for slope. And slope, we know, is going to be my rise over my run. Now the intervals, you're going to look for different sections of the graph. And it's pretty clear that we have one section here going to the right and up, and one section here going to the left and up. In fact, these would be the two different edges that we used to find the vertex here. So let's look at this idea of slope. How am I going to calculate my slope? Well, I'm going to go from one point on my edge to the next point up. And that goes up one over one. So my rise is one and my run is one. So that would mean that my slope here is going to be 1 divided by 1, which is 1. This works even if I go farther. So if I started here and I go all the way up to here, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I would have my slope would be 5 over 5, which is 1. So no matter how I count this, if I go from my adjacent ones or really far ones, I'm going to get the same calculation of slope as long as this side is a constant straight line. Let's think about the other side. So what's the slope over here? Now I start on this one and go here. I'm actually going down one over one. So that would be negative one over one. So my slope on that side would be negative one over 1, which is going to be negative 1. So here I have two different rates and two different intervals. I have a positive interval and a positive rate and a negative interval and a negative rate. So to put this all together, an absolute value is always going to have always will have a positive 
constant slope and a different section with a negative constant slope. Whoops. All right. Let's put it all together. The parent equation for the absolute value function is going to follow this general format. Actually, this is the vertex form of an absolute value function. It's my favorite form of the absolute value function. A here is representing the slope. It's not exactly the slope but it is the rate of change of the positive side here. H is going to be the x value of the vertex, and K is going to be the y value of the vertex. That means that we can actually discover all these pieces. So from the last section, which was the rate of change over intervals, we found out that my slope effectively was 1 over 1, or just 1. So I know my slope is going to be 1. My vertex, we learned earlier, was 0, 0. So that would make the x value 0 and the y value 0. So if I want to plug this equation in, what I get is y equals 1 x minus 0 plus 0. If I simplify this out, I don't need the 1 to be multiplying because that doesn't change anything, and I don't need to subtract by 0 and add 0. So my overall equation after manipulation would be y equals the absolute value of x. And this right here is the parent function of the absolute value function. Hope that helped.